product of a political dynasty, son of the country's second prime minister, nephew of its third, a leader whose party has been in power since independence from Britain in 1957. I don't give up easily. I, I have a lot of determination. I believe in what I'm doing. Najib Razak is a political survivor, having weathered accusations that hundreds of millions of dollars found their way into his bank account via a state fund called One MDB. There's no wrongdoing. The Saudi government has come up uh, with a statement admitting that it is an official donation. Now he's facing another test. An election against his former mentor, Mahathir Mohamad, who's now 92, was Prime Minister for 22 years. When I step down, and they call me a dictator, which dictator ever stepped down? And secondly, when I step down, people do curse me. I can walk around the streets and people come up to me and shake my hand. In this exclusive interview, Najib Razak talks openly about his achievements, his regrets, his opponent and the fallout from 1MDB. There's no doubting his political pedigree. A member of parliament at 23, Malaysia's youngest ever deputy minister at 25, 40 years in the business. Yet, to many, Najib Razak remains an enigma. His nine years in power marked as much by controversy as limited economic success. Bloomberg has secured the first international interview with Malaysia's prime minister in more than three years ahead of an election that's shaping up to be his greatest political challenge. Moving around, I feel that uh, um, most people, uh, you know, they want more predictability, more certainty, and they want a government uh, that's able to deliver. And the fact that over the last five years, we have delivered. And they know that we can deliver the next five years. I think that's key to the sense of uh, confidence. There is no um, uh, movement for, for, for changing the government. I don't, I don't see that. Uh, that's not saying that you know, we, will, we will win with a huge majority. No, I'm not going to predict that. But I'm going to say that we are uh, reasonably sanguine about the result. Uh, but I keep telling myself, myself and my, my colleagues as well, You've got to work hard. Are you willing to put a figure on how many seats you think you can win this time? Do you think it will be more than 2013? And is the two-thirds majority possibly <coughs> achievable? You know, I hate to set target uh, you know, for, for, for several reasons. Uh, but I think, I think uh, generally speaking, um, I am I'm expecting a better result than, than 2013. Uh, uh, one of the reasons is that the, the opposition is uh, a motley collection of parties, uh, you know, and they don't have much in common and they, will be, they were very derisive uh, in their comments of one another for decades. Uh, I, I don't see how they can work together, really work together. Amno did lose the popular vote in 2013. Uh, looking back, why do you think that happened? And what are you doing this time to ensure there's no repeat? Um, in the call for a change, uh, which uh, basically uh, the urban and primarily the Malaysian Chinese believe uh, a change was possible. And I now today they know it's not possible. So I think that euphoria uh, has uh, receded to a great extent. So there's several factors, I think. And the confidence level in that kind of, uh, of coalition between uh, uh, you know, enemies over decades uh, is something that, uh, it's hard sell, actually. And of course, uh, you know, a 93-year-old man trying to lead this coalition, it's, it's a hard sell as well. Mahathir was actually the man who helped bring you to power in 2009 and now here you are heading against each other in the election. What happened? What went so wrong with what was obviously a, a friendship and a, and a, a, a peer and a, a patron relationship? I think I have studied uh, the man. Uh, I think he is obsessed about control, about calling the shots. Uh, in fact, uh, when we were quite close uh, together, he even suggested 
uh, establishing a council of elders. And of course, you can imagine who's going to chair the council of elders. And, and you know, as a sitting prime minister, after every cabinet, I suppose I would have to march to his office to get his consent. I mean, that's not the way, you know, you run the government. I mean, for example, I mean, it's, there is this uh, gentleman rule, so to speak. I mean, you don't get uh, David Cameron uh, or, uh, or, you know, um, previous prime ministers in UK, you know, telling Theresa May what to do. And, and similarly, ex-presidents don't tell current presidents what to do. There is that you belong to a special club, if you like. Uh, and, and, and there is that kind of uh, mutual respect, understanding. And I, I, I'm, I adhere to that. One day, when I'm no longer in office, I would, I would not want to, uh, you know, to impose on my successor. Uh, but he is obsessed about control, and, and, and the key was that uh, he wanted me to do his bidding. Uh, for example, uh, he wanted so much a crooked bridge to be, to be carried out. And he was upset with uh, Tun Abdullah Badawi when he was prime minister because uh, he cancelled uh, the crooked bridge. And because Tun Abdullah Badawi uh, brought in uh, quite a number of, of young technocrats, uh, and that was signal that uh, he was not going to listen to Dr. Mahade. So in my case, it was when uh, I, I did not uh, continue with his um, request or his obsession to have a crooked bridge to be uh, implemented. Uh, and uh, when his son, uh, Mukris, lost the vice president, Amno vice presidency, I, you know, I didn't say no to him, but I said I thought it was too early for him to become vice president, not being a Supreme Council member. He'd have to prove his worth first before becoming vice president of Amno. But that was a turning point, and after that, uh, that was, he declared an open war against me. Do you see yourself as a survivor? At the last few years, there have been some, some difficult times for you um, in different ways. Uh, do you think that your opponents have underestimated you? Is that how you would describe yourself? Uh, oh, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you have to ask them. Uh, I, you know, I have, uh, I've always been uh, someone that's... Uh, you know, close to, um, to the people and also to the party members. Uh, you know, I believe in uh, uh, developing a personal relationship within the party. So even during difficult times, uh, the party stood uh, by me. Uh, they couldn't shake me. Uh, the support base is strong. Uh, and, and AMNO is even more united today than ever before. Uh, and uh, that's why, uh, you know, we, we have that um, sense of uh, uh, that we're moving forward uh, politically, economically and socially. One of the cornerstones of Najib Razak's time in power is the economy, which is enjoying its strongest pace in three years. GDP growth last year was almost 6% among the strongest in Asia. But that followed a string of difficulties on his watch as all prices fell and sentiment was hit by the scandal surrounding 1MDB. The Malaysian economy is making very uh, steady progress since we launched our transformation plan uh, in 2010. Uh, we've made uh, tremendous strides uh, in many areas. For example, if you take into account the growth rate from 2010 to 2017, we achieved 5.4% average and that's double the uh, growth rate for the world, global growth rate. Uh, if you talk in terms of uh, job creation, we created 2.7 million jobs. In terms of GNI increase, um, we have uh, achieved more than 50% increase in GNI. In terms of uh, capital market, for example, last, last year the capital market uh, grew by 12.6%. Uh, to reach 3.2 trillion ringgit. So those numbers, those figures, are indeed uh, indicative of uh, the success of our transformation plan. Going forward, what, what are your targets uh, to get to the balanced budget? Originally, we, uh, we were targeting 2020 uh, uh, to achieve balanced budget. 
but uh, we could um, achieve that if not for the, the crash in oil prices. Uh, but I think uh, if you talk realistically, I don't think we can achieve a balanced budget, but near enough by 2020. And I think by maybe 2022 or 2023, um, that's probably a more realistic uh, target for us to achieve balanced budget. Is there a specific achievement that you're particularly proud of? I think uh, in the um, all-encompassing uh, way that uh, you know, we are moving in a very positive uh, terms to become a high-income, uh, fully developed nation. I'm also proud of the fact that we have diversified the economy. Uh, when I came in, uh, we were over-dependent on oil and gas revenue uh, to the point of 41%. Today, it's roughly in the region about 14%. And so that's a tremendous uh, turnaround. Uh, we have been able to take brave, uh, sometimes maybe not all that popular decision, but they, were, they are the right decision. One of his party's biggest challenges is allaying concerns of the rising cost of living in the rural heartland. A 6% GST was introduced three years ago, which the opposition has vowed to remove if it wins power. For a country to succeed, we've got to have a long-term focus. You cannot be a populist in nature. You know, this GST was something that was uh, in the offing for 20 years. Uh, my predecessor didn't have the political courage to introduce it. We were at the cusp of introducing it, but it was withdrawn twice at the last moment. But I decided that it's the right decision, and I was willing to take that risk. Uh, but I know over time we'll, we will be proven right. Talking about post-elections, what can investors expect in terms of the biggest economic reforms from you after the elections? I think we will uh, you know, continue uh, to uh, make Malaysia a, a globally competitive nation. Uh, that's one. In other words, uh, you know, we will be um, um, improving our, our infrastructure, our connectivity, our uh, participation in terms of uh, 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 global trading arrangements, uh, making Malaysia more attractive for foreign investment, making Malaysia as a hub uh, for the region, uh, developing uh, a digital economy uh, you know, to achieve uh, a much higher percentage of our GDP, uh, the, the cost of a broadband and the speed of broadband to improve much faster. Uh, all those things and of course human capital to train our labour force uh, to become uh, much more in line with uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0 what went wrong with 1MDB? Did it stray from its uh, original uh, vision that, that you had when it was set up? You know, um, it started from, you know, the business model actually itself was not that uh, uh, sustainable. But uh, it, it became uh, an issue for what is essentially a business issue became a political issue because uh, my opponents wanted uh, to use one MDB uh, to change a democratically elected government between uh, election cycles. Uh, that's why they created this as, as a big issue. Uh, for example, uh, uh, quite a few years ago when the issue erupted, uh, Dr. Mahde himself made a statement that 42 billion disappeared into thin air, uh, when in fact it was 42 billion dead. Uh, but it was not money missing, you see. Uh, but when the issue um, uh, uh, erupted or uh, came to the fore, uh, as Prime Minister, I was the one who directed a uh, full investigation of 1MDB. But there were issues of governance which required more investigation. And, and I think uh, I have, I'm on record to say if there's any wrongdoing, uh, the law will take its, its, uh, its course and will be, will be enforced. Uh, so uh, that's, that's my position on it. And at, meanwhile, our rationalization program is working well. Uh, you know, our debt level has gone down to about 30 billion from 42 billion. 
uh, and we've got enough assets to cover our debts. What do you say uh, to those who say that you've, dis, uh, you've acted dishonestly about the funds? You know, you've been called all sorts of things, including a thief. What, what's your response to that? There's no evidence of that. I mean, you cannot just, you know, accuse somebody uh, of uh, being a thief or anything unless there's evidence. So that is a politically motivated statement. But you have admitted that the funds did end up in your accounts, even though it was a donation from the Saudi government. Yeah, it's been it's been part it's been cleared. There's been no wrongdoing, so I stand by it. There's no wrongdoing. The Saudi government has come out uh, with a statement admitting that it is an official donation. So, um, you know, I mean, the facts speak for themselves. But it's been turned to become a political issue. How has the one MDB issue damaged the government, yourself, Malaysia? Uh, there was some reputational damage, I have to admit that. But I think uh, when, when the international um, uh, rating agencies and, and, and all the international bodies look at, you know, like IMF, World Bank, and, you know, we, they examined, they came here, Fitch, Moody's, they even went to uh, one MDB's office, uh, you know, to look at the files, the figures. And I think. Uh, They've come to the conclusion that 1MDB will not impact Malaysia economically. Do you regret uh, what happened? And looking back, is there anything that you would have done differently? Yes, I would have done. Uh, I would have probably uh, uh, not have that kind of business model. Uh, probably I will um, make sure tight uh, supervision. Uh, but we all learn from our, our, our mistakes, you know, and, and that, that should not uh, uh, you know, uh, detract uh, from on the huge number of successes that we have in other areas. There's been a clear shift in Malaysia, not so much away from traditional investors as to more towards China. And that hasn't always sat well with the Malay majority. Najib Razak's government maintains strong relations with the US, but China's influence is growing. Well, I have, uh, I have a good, warm, you know, personal relationship with uh, uh, President Donald Trump. As you know, I, I knew him before he became famous. He was famous then, but he was more famous today. So I think uh, uh, the two important things that matter to him would be, you know, how to uh, make Malay uh, United States great and uh, create more jobs. Uh, that's one. Number two, how to make uh, United States safe. I think those are the two things very much uppermost in his mind. Do you talk with him about his view on the US role in Asia? Is that something that you're still concerned about? Um, and do, do you feel that gives an opportunity to China um, to escalate uh, its rise in the region? Uh, we, we believe in good relations with the major global powers, you know, China and the United States. I think both countries have a role to play in Asia. Uh, we had wanted the United States to be part of uh, TPP uh, because TPP was uh, a very important uh, economic influence of the United States in this region, but unfortunately they, they withdrew. Uh, but at the same time, we also believe that the, the Belt and Road Initiative initiated by President Xi is a very good platform uh, for, you know, for rapid economic uh, Development. You mentioned Belt and Road and obviously that's the prospect of enormous amounts of money coming into key projects and infrastructure um, in many countries globally. Uh, for, for Malaysia though, do you worry that that could come with strings attached at some point? Of course, it, you know, it will increase China's influence in the region. Uh, but we also um, you know, uh, have our own position and to deal with uh, certain issues uh, revolving uh, South China Sea, for example, you know, I think for as long as uh, ASEAN, uh, you know, remains united, and the fact that China is more obsessed about, uh, you know, becoming an, the number one economy in the world, I don't think China will risk uh, in, a, in any irresponsible uh, action that will undermine, you know, its rise to become the largest economy in the world. Within Malaysia, how do you ensure on those projects, for example, that uh, Malaysians also have opportunities when it comes to the work 
or the projects and they, they don't get squeezed out by Chinese companies and Chinese labour. We have uh, ensured that's part of the contract. Uh, you know, for example, uh, a lot of the uh, infrastructure work uh, you know, will be done by Malaysian companies uh, and uh, they are to employ uh, Malaysian uh, people uh, to work on their project. Uh, for example, the East Coast Rail link, we have, we have put certain preconditions as part of the contract. Uh, so I'm mindful of the fact that it should not be seen as you know, a Chinese project in its entirety, but Malaysians must feel that they benefit from the project. I wanted to ask you one final question about China, and it's about the phrase China's rise, which seems to get used a lot, uh, China's rise, and sometimes with slightly ominous overtones of evil China rising. Um, what's your view of China's rise, and what kind of power do you think it wants to be? I think that uh, the rise of China is inevitable. I mean, you know, whatever you say, you can't stop it. <laughs> it's, it's inevitable. And we always like to see China as, as, as a force of uh, good, you know, f for the region in a sense that, uh, you know, a, a, a big economy in China is also good for us. For example, you know, China is our largest trading partner. And uh, China buys palm oil from Malaysia. It's good for our smallholders. China buys even our durians. It's good for our smallholders too. <laughs> so it's a big market. I think China will continue to be a responsible uh, nation. Uh, and uh, we, 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 I know it's a cliche to talk peaceful rise, but uh, we believe uh, there are no reasons for us to doubt that will happen. So there you have it, a country of 32 million people on the verge of its most crucial election in decades. I'm Haslinda Amin in Putrajaya. Thanks for watching.